good. I'm, I, feel, I feel loved now. Well, good morning. So good to have you with us. It's been amazing. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. And thank you for engaging in worship without the words. That, that can be a little difficult if you don't know the words to the song. So thank you for engaging with your hearts and with your, with your song. And hopefully some of you just made up some words. That's what I do. When I don't know the words, I just make them up a little bit. Um, today's a, a great day because one of us was born today. Kathy Phillips' birthday is today, so happy birthday. We're so thankful that you were born and that you're here with us, so thank you. Um, real quick, I just want to talk about kind of what I sensed this morning going on. It's not a part of my message, but I think it's important to set our hearts to where we're at this morning. Um, See, when, when Jesus died and then he rose again, there was disciples heading somewhere. They were heading to Emmaus. And they come across this person, which was Jesus, but they didn't recognize him. And they walked with him and he talked with him. He taught him about how he, how Jesus was throughout all of scripture. And then eventually at dinner, he reveals himself. And this is what they say. And then he disappears. Isn't that like Jesus? Reveals himself and then disappears. And they said, they asked each other, weren't our hearts burning within us? While he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. So today, I just ask that you open your hearts and let them burn this morning. No matter what I say, because that really doesn't matter. It's what's he, what is he saying this morning? What is the Spirit saying? So just open your hearts and let them burn this morning as, it, as we let God speak to us. Let the Spirit speak to your heart this morning. So I, I don't know how many of you were here several weeks ago when we had Mark Crawford. You were here. Wasn't that wonderful? I love him. He's an amazing man, amazing friend to have. Um, but he gave a word over the church and preached the message over... He talked about four gemstones and the different aspects of those. That, and he kind of talked about one aspect from each of those. Not that that's what all the gem is about, but it's just one aspect of those. And there was one in particular that I want to talk about today because I think it could be helpful for us as we're finishing this year and moving into 2025, which seems ridiculous that this year is almost over. Like, we only have six more Sundays to gather together for the rest of the... Stop saying it. It's true. You want me to stop speaking truth, Kathy? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> but it is true. It, this year is coming to an end, which is good, because that means a new season starts. Even though the season's been good, it's always good to go into a new season. Because you can't get into the new season unless the old season has happened. Amen. Right? We can't get into summer unless spring's happened. All right. Maybe you need to go back to school, learn about the seasons. <laughs> this is how the world works. I know our school system doesn't quite teach stuff anymore sometimes. Especially math. How many? Never mind. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I can't understand my third grade, third grader's math anymore, but all right, back on subject. Here we go. So one of them that he talked about was shock back into rhythm, and he talked about how his heart was out of rhythm, and it needed to be shocked so it can get back into rhythm, and he was talking about as relating to the mission, and then he talked, said something about me that I, having the rhythm of the mission in my heart. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. Like what is the rhythm of the mission? And also where is your place in the rhythm of the mission? Because the mission isn't just me. And it's not just you. It's all of us. This building 
is just a building. But with you in it, then it becomes the mission. Because the mission is about people. The church is about people, not buildings or individuals. So Paul writes a letter in Corinthians about how the body functions together. So we're going to be in uh, Corinthians chapter 12 today. But he talks about how it binds us together, that there's a rhythm that everybody should be a part of. And when everybody's following the same rhythm, there's movement. See, in a a band, when you have, there's a rhythm that all the instruments need to follow, right? Weren't you glad the worship team could follow the rhythm today? Because we've all been in situations where there's an instrument or two that can't quite follow the rhythm. And it's very obvious. But with rhythm, all the instruments can follow it. Did you know that? That every instrument can follow the rhythm? Even though they all sound different, they can still always follow the same rhythm. Which should make you happy. (laughs) That anybody can follow the rhythm. But when there isn't a rhythm, there's nothing to anchor to. And the band can go in all sorts of directions. But when they can tie into the rhythm, it anchors them together. Even though you might be playing a different instrument, you still can go with each other and actually get somewhere and accomplish something. So Paul identifies here in... uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, identifies what is that rhythm? What holds everything together? And this is verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. So he's saying there's all sorts of different gifts, services, workings. Basically, there's all sorts of different instruments, but there's one spirit. The spirit is the rhythm that everything else needs to follow. See, we all do different things. We all have different gifts, different abilities, different things that we're good at and we all have things that we're not good at. But the rhythm is the spirit. So if we can follow the spirit, then you're going to fit right in. That your instrument, your gifts, your callings, what you do as a person fits. Because what I do in my gifts and callings are way different than Kathy's. Definitely Paris's. And I love it. Because she hides all my, in, my where I'm not good. She does amazing at that. But God doesn't call us to all be the same. He doesn't give us all the same gifts. He doesn't give us all the same talents. I wish I can jump and dunk the basketball. That would be amazing. But God did not create me to be able to do that. But for some of you, you might be able to do that. And we're all different. But Paul is saying here, we need to have the same spirit. That the spirit is what brings everything together. So you might be asking yourself, why should I, why should I play my instrument? Why should I be active in a community? Why should I share my talents and my abilities with a community? Paul answers that in verse 7. He says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So what are he saying? 
is what's inside of you, the spirit that lives inside of you, the Holy Spirit, is meant for you, but actually it's meant for the good of the person next to you and the person that sits on the other side of the row or the other side of this building. That the spirit in you, the gifts and talents, the manifestation of having the spirit in you is for everybody else. Is it's for the common good of everybody. So if you're not letting the manifestation of the spirit come out, then you're not following what Paul is teaching us here. That, hey, no, actually, you matter. That you are a part of the common good of a community. That sitting on the sidelines isn't good enough. That actually you have to be a part of it. And you're, when you do that, you bring good to everybody else. Because you're the only one that can fill that spot in the band. There's no other instrument like you. You have a unique sound that only you can produce. And when you don't produce it, then the band doesn't quite sound right. Doesn't quite sound as full. And it doesn't quite accomplish what it's going after. So Paul says it's for the common good. But he goes on to describe the manifestations, the gifts. Verse 8. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by, the same, by one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. That was a big mouthful. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. See, you have gifts inside of you. You all have them. All these things that Paul's listing here, you can actually all function in. You can actually manifest these through the Spirit. And Paul is saying, yeah, every, each one of you has this. He's distributed them. Now, some of you are better at them than others, or certain ones you're better at, and that's okay. But we all have these. But it all works from one spirit, from the same spirit. Paul, you kind of see a theme here. Paul keeps coming back to this, but it's of the same spirit. That the spirit you prophesy out of is the same spirit you're going to release healing. The same spirit you're going to release a kind word, a blessing. And the person next to you is going to do the same thing. It's the same spirit that they should be functioning out of. What does that tell you? Everybody's on the same playing field. Everyone has the same spirit. Nobody has more than the other. Like nobody gets the, oh, I get the grade A Holy Spirit. And the other people get the grade B Holy Spirit. They get the B team Holy Spirit. That doesn't exist. We all have the same Holy Spirit. So if you see somebody operating in a spiritual gift, and you're like, oh, they can do that, but I don't think I can. No, 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 no. You see somebody operating a spiritual gift, and you're like, oh, I would like to be able to do that. And the Holy Spirit says, yeah, you can do that. The same spirit that's in them is in you. We just got to be willing to do it. You got to be willing to step out. 
Because that person that operates in it at a level that you want to get at took a chance, was willing to mess it up. They were willing to fail at it. And really, that's what it comes down to. Are we willing to fail at it? See, I, growing up, I didn't want, I didn't, nobody likes to fail, right? So a lot of times I wouldn't do anything, do something, unless I knew I could do it. If I thought I could fail at it, then I wouldn't do it. I would come up with some excuse not to do it. But if I think I could win or be good at it, then I would do it. And it limited me on what I can accomplish or what I can do. But more importantly, it limited how people could receive from me. That the people around me couldn't benefit from me trying something new. And for me trying to do something and taking the risk of screwing up or messing it up. See, when you don't try something because you're afraid, it costs the people around you. It costs your family. It costs your friends. It costs the world you live in if you're, willing not, if you're not willing to take a chance and be willing to fail. Because Paul's saying here, hey, it's one spirit. Go for it. Just go for it. Because if you see it, you can do it. It's what Jesus said. You'll do greater things than I did. If you can see it. It's what he, the message to his disciples was, look, if you've seen it, you can do it. And then not only have you seen it, but things you haven't seen yet, you'll still be able to do those too. Like we think the bar is, well, if Jesus did it, then that's the bar we got to get to. But Jesus actually set the bar beyond that. He said the starting point is the things I've done. Because you're going to do greater things. So that's actually the goal is to be doing the greater things than what Jesus did. But we get there by being together. This is verse 12 is giving us an example of how we're supposed to operate. This is 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Just as a body through one, though one has many parts, but all its many parts from one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So Paul's using the human body here to explain all this, to kind of give us a picture of what the body of Christ should look like and how the church should view itself and others. And he's saying here, no matter who you are, what background you have, what your race or station in life is, what political party you are in, we are one body. That it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what life you've led, lived. Paul's saying, no, 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 we're all one body. We're all one. We're separate parts. We're all different instruments of the band. But we're one band. We're one body. Because there's many parts Many different parts and interesting parts of the body. They look different. They function differently. They sound differently. But they're all parts of one body. And in that, it can be very easy for us to compare ourselves to other people. Right? We all do it. Whether it's in our job, in our home, here whatever part of life you're in, 
it's really easy to start comparing yourself to what the other person is doing. And Paul addresses that here in verse 15. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. Verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? See, comparison will rob you of who you're supposed to be. See, you're not supposed to be like the person next to you. You're not supposed to be the person you do life with. How many of you ever seen people that have been married for a long time and they start looking like each other. They start dressing like each other. They wear matching outfits. They eat the same exact food. And it gets a little creepy, in my opinion. But you are uniquely made. So when you compare yourself and use other people as a line of where you should be, it robs you of who you're supposed to be and robs you of your journey that the Holy Spirit has you on. Because we're all on a journey and we're all at different parts of our journey. And what that person needs is gonna be different than what you need in your journey. And Paul is saying here, don't compare yourself because you're not going to have the same function or the same job or the same way of doing something. Because if the eye is trying to act like a mouth, you're just going to be stumbling around life. You're just going to be running into things, tripping over things. But if, if the mouth is trying to be the eye, you'll starve to death and you'll die. And that's what happens when you let comparison get into your heart, into your body. When you start comparing yourself, you stop being who you are called to be, which this community needs you to be. We need you to be who you are, who God created you to be. We don't need a hundred mouths. We don't need a hundred eyes. We don't need a hundred feet. But we do need fingers and noses and muscles and tendons and all the parts of the body to work together. Because if it doesn't, you have chaos and you start limping. If you don't have a foot, you start limping. And we don't want to limp. Right? But it creates a unique sound when every body part, when every instrument is playing what they're supposed to play. Because if you try to get a guitar to play like a trumpet, it's not going to go well. But God is the one that created you to be a part of the body. He created you as a part of a body. He didn't create you to be by yourself. You're to be to function in the rhythm with the rest of the body. Verse 18, but in fact God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all part, where would the body be? Or if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. See, that's how God designed us. He designed us to be in community with one another and to bring the peace that you own. Bring the peace that you are to create a whole body. Paul goes on to talk about the significance of each. This is verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts 
that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. We need each other. And it doesn't matter what role you play. We need you. The person next to you needs you. This community needs you. And you fulfill a significant role here at the mission. Because you matter. You matter. The individual matters. Because you can only fill that one spot. And nobody else can. Doesn't matter what instrument you play. It has equal value to the body. Even if you're the triangle that they just ding (laughs) once or twice a song. It's still valuable. It's still needed. We affect each other. What happens to one of us happens to all of us. Years ago, I was playing softball, and I expanded my rotator cuff. So every time I went to throw the ball, it was an excruciating pain. And I'd I'd never had problems with my shoulder before, and I didn't realize how much it actually affected everything else I did. So I was playing, a ball was hit to me, I go to throw it to first, even though the doctor said you need to stop throwing, but... We don't listen to doctors sometimes. And I went to throw it, and as I threw it, the pain was so severe in my shoulder that my legs gave out. And I crumpled to the ground. My legs were perfectly healthy. There was nothing wrong with my legs. But because there was something wrong with my shoulder, it affected my legs. And Paul's saying here, hey, If it affects one of us, it affects all of us. You know, the opposite is true, too. You know, getting a massage, a shoulder massage is wonderful, and it makes your whole body feel good. It relaxes your whole body. Because what affects one affects the other is verse 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. So this is a great statement here, because when one of you is honored, we all get honored. When I get honored, that means you're being honored. Which I understand, you know, I'm up front, I'm a leader in this place, so people will come, you know, prophets or speakers will come and honor us, or honor me or dad or mom and say how grateful they are for us. But you have to realize what they're really saying is they're grateful for all of you. That when we're honored, you're being honored. Because we can't have the impact that we have without you. Like it's, all of our impact that they feel. So when we go out, when we go out to other places to speak or minister or go overseas, the impact we have is your impact because we couldn't do it without you. We actually pull on you when we're out there and what you bring to the table, what you manifest out of your spirit the gifts and callings that you use, we get a part of that. We get to tap into that because we're one body. And the same when you guys, when you get honored, I go, oh, I, I get a piece of that. I'm going to take some of that. When someone brags about one of you, I'm like, oh, thank you. Yeah, they are awesome, but, you know, I get a little piece of that because I'm connected to them. I'm part of their body. 
so for one, it eliminates the comparison thing. Why aren't they talking about me? Because they are actually talking about you. They are. If you've plugged into the body. If you are being an active part of the body. If you've severed yourself off from the body, then what, what good is that anymore? And we don't want that. Because you are part of the body. And we don't function correctly without you. Same with breakthroughs. When someone has a breakthrough in our community, we all get to benefit from that. We can all take a hold of it and go, oh, God, you did it for them. You can do it for me. You know, just like my shoulder. When my shoulder finally healed up, the rest of my body rejoiced. (laughs) So whenever somebody has a testimony, a breakthrough, and you need that breakthrough, just grab a hold of it. Go to that person and say, hey, I heard you had breakthrough in it. Will you pray for me? Because I want that, would you release that over me? Because we're part of the same body. And if they have a breakthrough, you get a breakthrough. So take advantage of it. Don't buy into the lie that you're not a part of the body. That you don't matter. That you don't have a significant role here at the mission. Paul goes on to describe some functions of the church. Verse 28, and God has placed in the church first all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. And yet, I will show you the most excellent way. I love how Paul doesn't actually answer those questions. The questions are all apostles, are all prophets. He doesn't answer that question. He just says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Which means, you can go after all of them. You can operate in all those gifts. Now, are, is some people called to the function or the office of the fivefold? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean you can't operate in that. You can operate in all of them. You can take a hold of the grace that they release in those offices. And off, all, if I can simplify it, or at least this is how I simplify it for myself. It's just a job description. The fivefold ministry is just a job description. It's not a hierarchy. So if I'm a, a prophet, then that means I have a job to do. If I'm an apostle, I have a certain job to do. I have a certain assignment to do. If I'm a teacher, I have an assignment to do. But everybody can operate in all of them. I don't think you guys are quite there. But it'll set you free if you will actually grab a hold of that and believe that, that you can actually operate in all of them. And that's the job of those offices is to teach you how to operate in those. It's not to be the superstar. It's actually to release the grace and teach people how to operate in those fivefold ministry. So saying, well, well, I'm not an evangelist, so I don't need to do that. I am a prophet, so I don't. No, it's not how that works. You have to. You actually have to get to be involved in all of it. You can operate in all of it. And Paul's saying here, go after it. Eagerly desire the greater gifts. So go for it. But then he says something very interesting. 
He says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. To me, this comes from the movie of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. If you don't know what that is, go watch it and you'll understand this line. And yet I show you the most excellent way. But Paul is saying here, okay, everything I've talked about is great. But there's even a more excellent way of doing all what I just talked about. Okay? You got it? So there's a greater way. There's a a part that every part of the body needs to function this way. That the rhythm that everybody needs is the following. And this is the part, this is part of the rhythm of the mission. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clinging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. He's not saying don't do those things. He's saying do them, but do them in the rhythm of love. That everything we do has to be in the rhythm of love. That it's got to be anchored to love. That no no matter what part of the body you are, it's got to be in the rhythm of love. How you operate as a hand needs to be done in love. As a mouthpiece, eyes, ears, nose, all of that needs to be operated in the rhythm of love. Because if we don't do it in love, it's just, you're just making a bunch of noise. Come on. You're like a three-year-old that just got a drum set for Christmas. <laughs> Banging with all their might, with no rhythm, they're just making noise. And that's what it's like when we do all these things, but don't do it out of love. So at the mission, this is our goal. Not that we are perfect at this. We have to work at it. But whatever we do, we try to do it out of love. Whatever it is. So the Candy Fest, we do it because we love our community. And we want to love those people that, nev- that rarely ever feel the love of Jesus. We, pro- we teach you how to prophesy so you can function out of love and hear God for other people so they know what God thinks of them. Yes. Thank you. They know how God loves them. So we try to do whatever we do here in the rhythm of love. Or else we're just making noise. We're just staying busy, not really accomplishing much. But when it's done out of love, it has power. See, whatever we do out of love has power. Because we're operating like Jesus operated. It says, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say he did it because it needed to be done. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to send my son because it sounds like a good idea. He said, no, 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 because I loved, I sent him. So what are some takeaways from this morning? There are many instruments, and they have their own sound, but they're all needed. The body is made up of many parts. Every part is needed. You are needed. You all have a place in the family. And the rhythm 
of this family is love. Why don't you stand with me? I hope you caught what this message is about. It's about that you matter, that you are significant, and the mission needs you. We need you to be who you are, who you were created to be, and to line up with the rhythm of the mission, just do it out of love. It's really that simple. Just do it out of love. But you got to do it. You got to be the body part God called, has called you to do and to be. So I'd encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit in this season, as this 24 is closing and we're going into 25. For 25, what is my assignment? What body part, what instrument am I supposed to be for the mission in 2025? And then you gotta take responsibility for it. Because that's a lot of reasons why we don't do anything, because we don't really wanna take responsibility. You're hoping somebody else will play that instrument or somebody else will be that part of the body. But Paul is saying, no, no, no. There's only one like you. Nobody else can take your place. You are the answer. And you are a part of the family. Whether you've been here for a day or 30 something years, you're a significant part of the family. So let's, let's, let's have a conversation with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you that you're here. You've been here all day. You've been here before we even stepped in this room. Speak to us now of where our place is in the body, where you've called us to be, where in this new season, what are we supposed to be? Are we supposed to be an ear or a hand or a foot or a leg or a mouth or an eye? Whatever it is. We say use us. That we will take a chance. That we'll risk failing. So that we could be good to the people around us. That the common good So Holy Spirit, guide us to what our role will be for 2025. We thank you that you made us a part of the family, that you grafted us in, that no matter what our background is, what we've done in life, that you made us part of the family. So we thank you that you are that amazing that you sent your son because you loved us so that we could be new creations part of a new body that gets to go out and love on the world around us so thank you for calling us to be world changers so teach us how to be world changers in 2025. So we give you our hearts. We give you our abilities. We give you our gifts to be used for your kingdom, that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you agree with that, say amen. Can I have the ministry team come on down? Like I said, Jesus is in the room. Like the guys 
disciples that were walking on the road didn't realize who they were with. But I hope by now you realize who's in the room, that Jesus is in the room. And if you need a miracle this morning, if you need healing this morning, I would encourage you to come down and get prayed for, especially if you have shoulder problems. There's healing for you in the room. No matter how little it is, there's healing for you in the room. Jesus cares about one single hair on your head. He cares enough that he knows them. So he cares about what's going on in your life. So come down, get ministered to. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you this morning. Don't forget about Saturday. It's going to be an amazing event. And Friday night we have the well. We got a lot going on. Amazing stuff. So get there. Let's worship Jesus. Have a great week. We'll see you back this week.